Welcome to the channel, it's so nice to have you here for my very first YouTube video ever. This video is about the board game Clue and how the default strategy for playing it is all wrong. By learning the tips and strategies in this video, you'll be able to crush your friends at the game and finally prove to them who's smarter than them at this very specific contrived murder mystery board game. So today our goals are first, to learn the rules of Clue thoroughly, second, to learn the strategy you're supposed to use and use examples to learn why that's not the best, and third, I'll teach you how to play the game even better. We'll come up with a nice notation system and a precise procedure you can use to deduce all the knowledge you can and solve the murder mystery before anybody else does. I'm a software engineer with over 10 years of experience in Silicon Valley. I've always been a technical thinker throughout my whole life, whether it's been graphing little games and programs on my calculator, working through this exact problem one summer when my family got super into this game, and of course throughout my whole career. Throughout my career I've honed what I think is my best skill at work, which is analyzing problems and breaking them down into smaller chunks so we can build them piece by piece. And that's exactly what we'll do in this video. So with all that said, I think we're ready to get problem solving, so let's get into it. So like I said, the board game Clue is a logical deduction board and card game. In the game, players play fancy characters invited to a fancy mansion for a dinner party. And of course at this dinner party, there's been a murder. It's player's job to solve that murder by asking questions and logically deducing who did the murder with what weapon in which room. When I was growing up, my family got super into this game one summer and it ended up being the second programming project I ever did in my life. So now with a lot more programming experience under my belt, I want to revisit this topic and hopefully do it better. Okay, so how do you play? In the game, there are six suspects, six weapons, and nine rooms. Suspects are people like Colonel Mustard, Professor Plum, Mrs. White, etc. Weapons are things like the knife, the revolver, or the wrench. And rooms are rooms like kitchen, ballroom, library, etc. To set the game up, you first take one card from each category and put them at random into a little case file. Nobody knows which three cards are in this case file, and it's what defines the murder. Who did the murder, with which weapon, in which room. You then take this little case file pouch and put it aside for the rest of the game until somebody thinks they've solved the murder, and we'll get to that. The rest of the 18 cards are shuffled all together and dealt to all the players. Each player can see the cards in their hand, of course, but they don't know what anybody else has. Players spend the rest of the game in turns moving around the board and making suggestions, aka guesses, about the murder in order to deduce, by a process of elimination, which three cards must be in that case file. Once a player thinks they've solved the murder, they make an accusation saying who did the murder with which weapon in which room, at which point they open the case file themselves to see if they are right. If they were right, they say ha and rub it in everyone's faces. And if they are wrong, they go into a corner and cry while everyone else continues the game. There is also a game board in the middle of the table where players roll dice and walk around the mansion from room to room, making these guesses, but our clue solver won't really deal with that at all, so let's just forget that for the rest of the series to keep our lives simple. Uh, uh, you wanna clean that drawing up a little bit? Great, thanks. Okay, so the crux of the game is this logical deductions through making suggestions, so how do you do that? On a player's turn, if they're on a room on the board, but again, let's forget about the board, a player can make a suggestion by listing out the three cards they think might be in the murder. A suspect, a weapon, and a room. You know, I'm not trying to point fingers or anything, but I think maybe the murder was done by Colonel Mustard with the revolver in the ballroom. Once a player makes that suggestion, the other players go in reverse order and are obligated to show one of the cards 
from that suggestion if they have it in their hand. If they don't have any of the cards, then they pass. So as an example, let's say that Anisha suggests Colonel Mustard with the revolver in the ballroom. Cho gets the first chance to refute, and she says she's unable to, so she passes. Bob says he can refute, and shows Anisha a card. If we're an outside observer, that's all we know. Bob showed some card to Anisha, but we don't know what it is. So let's pretend for a second that we are Anisha, and Bob showed us the revolver. As Anisha, we now know that the murder couldn't have been done with the revolver, because that card is in Bob's hand, and not in the case file. It's a pretty simple process of elimination. So to keep track of it all, the game comes with little checklists in the box for everyone to use to cross off the cards as they make suggestions and eliminate them. So the checklist... Go ahead, I'll give you a second. Go ahead, take your time. This is what the checklist that comes out of the box looks like. I've shortened it up here to keep it small, but it would have all 21 cards in the game listed out. So again, in the previous example, if we were Anisha and Bob showed us the revolver, we would go to this checklist and check it off saying, nope, it can't be the revolver. It's also worth mentioning that right at the beginning when players are dealt their cards, they can immediately cross off every single one of those from the checklist. So the game proceeds like this in a pretty simple suggestion, refutation, process of elimination, cross off a card one by one by one until you finally have three left and that's when you know who did the murder because those three cards must be the ones in the case file. So pretty simple, just process of elimination one by one. Why are we doing this again? It turns out that the logic is actually a little more complex which we'll get to in a second. Okay, so as I hinted before, the logic gets a little bit more complicated, so let's illustrate that with some examples. For our first example, let's once again say we're playing as Anisha, and we have Colonel Mustard, the wrench, and the dining room. Cho makes a suggestion of Colonel Mustard, the knife, and the dining room. Bob is able to refute it, and he shows her a card. Though we didn't see the card that Bob showed, of course we know what it was. We have Colonel Mustard, and we have the dining room, so the only card Bob could have used to refute was the knife. So therefore, we can cross off the knife on our checklist. Notice in this example we were able to eliminate a card even though we didn't see it ourselves. But you can actually do even better than that. In a different game, let's say that someone suggests Professor Plum with the lead pipe in the library and Chelsea is able to refute, showing a card. Later on, somebody suggests Miss Scarlet with the lead pipe in the library, and this time Chelsea is unable to refute. In this case, we now retroactively know which card she used for that first guess. It has to be Professor Plum, because she doesn't have the lead pipe and she doesn't have the library, or else she would have been able to refute that second suggestion. Notice in this case, we never saw the card she used to refute, and we're not basing it on the cards in our own hand, so it's basically common knowledge now that Chelsea has Professor Plum. Continuing the example, let's say we have the kitchen in our hand. Somebody suggests Professor Plum with the rope in the kitchen. We could refute with the kitchen, but before it's our chance, Bo refutes with a card. Again, we immediately know what Bo refuted with. We have the kitchen, we already know Chelsea has Professor Plum, so Bo must have had the rope. In this example, we're combining multiple bits of knowledge together to deduce new bits of knowledge. The more knowledge we have, the more we can deduce, the more knowledge we have, the more we can deduce, etc. So, as my family was playing this all summer and we were discovering these deduction rules, we were having a hard time keeping track of it all. And as a kid with nothing better to do that summer, I came up with a better format for the checklist. Editor guy, speed this up. Thank you. Basically, in this new checklist, we're tracking as much game state, or knowledge state, 
as possible. Not just what we've directly seen, but every possible place that every card could possibly be. This new checklist has two parts. The checklist, on top, which tracks where all the cards are in all the players' hands, and the suggestion log underneath, tracking all the suggestions that every player has ever made. In the checklist on top, we're tracking three states for every card and player. For a particular card and player, we can either definitely know that they have it, in which case we put a Y, or we can definitely know that they do not have that card, in which case we put an N. Otherwise, it's an unknown and we leave it blank. Down at the bottom, we're basically just taking notes about the suggestions, who said what, who refuted it, etc. We can work with this checklist in rules that fall into two categories. The first category I like to call consistency rules. These rules deal with just the checklist on the top, making sure that everything is logically consistent and makes sense. For example, if we have a Y in one row, then we know that everything else is an N. Because if one person has a card, then nobody else can. Also, if we know how many cards a player has, and we've accounted for that many Ys in that column, then we can mark all the rest of them as Ns. For example, if Bob has five cards, and we've identified all five of them, then we know he doesn't have any of the rest. And for the case file, we know that there's only one card of each category, so if we have a Y for one suspect in the case file, we know the rest of the suspects have Ns. The second way we can work with the checklist is what I call deduction rules. These concern the suggestion log at the bottom, basically folding in new information as we can. So let's see how this checklist works with our examples from before. In the second example, we only gave Chelsea a name, so let's just say she's playing against Alex and Bo. So Bo suggests Professor Plum with the lead pipe in the library. We write this in the suggestion log as follows. We write Bo in the first column because he was the person suggesting. We write the three cards that he suggested. And then in the columns for the other players, we write what happened. So right off the bat, we can put a little squiggle under Bo's name there because he's the suggester. We're not gonna be able to get any information about his cards. And this wasn't in the example before, but let's say Alex was unable to refute. At that point, we can put an X under his name indicating that he doesn't have any of those cards. And then Chelsea is able to refute, so we put a mini checklist under her name in this row. Later, someone else, let's say Alex, suggests Miss Scarlet with the lead pipe in the library. Again, right off the bat, we can put a squiggly under Alex's name because he's the suggester. He's the suggester, and we won't be able to learn anything about his cards. Then immediately, Chelsea passes, she's not able to refute, so we put an X under her name. And then, doesn't really matter, but let's say Bo is also not able to refute. Usually in the game that would be a lot of information, but let's just kind of scratch that out. So we were able to quickly write down what happened, and now it's time to process that information. Let's do this suggestion by suggestion. In the first one, it's easy. Alex was not able to refute, he has an X, so we can go up to the checklist and quickly put an N for all the three cards that were suggested. For Chelsea, there's not really much we can do at this point. We don't know if she does or doesn't own any of these cards, so we just move on. In the second suggestion, we can also say that Bo and Chelsea don't have any of these cards, so we can put six ends up on the checklist. At this point, we've gotten all the info we can out of the second suggestion, so I like to put a little check mark there to say we don't need to look at it again. But we have discovered some new information, which means we might be able to deduce more. So we gotta go through the list of suggestions again. Starting back at the first one, we've already processed Alex's X, so now it's time to look at Chelsea's cell. For each of these three cards, we check whether she has them, and if she doesn't, we cross it off this little mini checklist. Turns out we've crossed off two out of three of them, so we can circle the last one, because that's the card she refuted with, and then go back up to the checklist to put a Y in that space. At this point, we've gotten all the information out of the first suggestion, so we can put a check mark there and move on. We should also quickly apply our consistency rules.
And as it turns out, I wasn't thinking about this at all, but in this example, we figured out the weapon and the room. Like I said, when two people aren't able to refute a guess, it gives you a lot of information, especially when the third person also wasn't able to refute with very similar cards. So finally, let's just list out all these consistency and deduction rules. We're going to be coding them up later, so we might as well have a full list of them right now. So first off, for every row, if there's a Y somewhere in that row, the rest are ends. Basically, a card can only exist in one place. The inverse is, if a row has ends in every place except for one, we know that last one must be a Y. In other words, the card must exist somewhere. Next, for every player, since we know the number of cards they have, if we've accounted for all of those with Ys, we know the rest of the column should be filled with ends. Likewise, the inverse of that is if we've eliminated all but that number of cards of Ys with ends, then we know the rest must be Ys. That almost never happens in real life, but it's there. For the case file, we have basically the same thing, except it's one card per category. If there's a single Y in one category, then we know the rest are ends. If there's ends everywhere except for one spot in the category, that last one must be a Y. And then our deduction rules. For each guess, for each player that was given the opportunity but unable to refute a guess, we know they don't have any of those cards. For each player that was able to refute a suggestion, they must have one of those three cards. If we're able to eliminate one of them, we can cross it off the list. Once we're able to eliminate two, we know they must have refuted with the third, and therefore have the third. It's also worth the reminder that we can never get information about the suggester, since they could always technically make a suggestion for three cards they have already themselves. And we don't get any information from players who didn't even get a chance to refute that suggestion. So there we have all of our consistency and deduction rules listed out together. We've accomplished a lot in this video. We learned about Clue, the rules, how to play, how to deduce, how to deduce better, how to checklist better, and we have a nice notation system to track all the knowledge that we have and process new suggestions in order to deduce new knowledge. And finally, listing out all the deduction rules and consistency rules that we'll be coding up later. It also turns out that these deduction rules can't get everything. That's a little bit of a spoiler, and we'll get there later. If you enjoy this video, please let me know in the comments. Hopefully I'm pointing in the right place. Give the video a like and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. We can continue building off of our knowledge, develop the data structures and algorithms we need, and eventually make it into an actual web app. There are so many places we can go with this topic, building on top of each other until we build our web app, and little sidebars that we can explore along the way. Here's a few that I can think of just to get you excited. So again, let me know which topics you want to explore, and we'll get into it. I'll see you down there, and until next time, bye bye.